Hello, I'm just popping on before we get into this video because it was filmed a few weeks ago and in those last few weeks alone there have been a lot of blooming changes to things like social support and the way people are going to be assessed for sickness benefits. So before we go any further, I just want to make sure that my position on all of this stuff is crystal clear and leaves no room for doubt. A lot of my work aims to help people who are living with a chronic illness and they are well enough to work or they are looking for work. The world of work often isn't inclusive for people with energy limiting conditions and with the stuff I do I hope to make that process a little bit easier and a little bit more accessible for people. But that doesn't change the fact that not everybody with a chronic illness is well enough to work and this is not news. I say it all the time but managing a long term illness is like a blooming full time job in itself and forcing somebody into work that they aren't well enough for. It isn't the solution to the issue that people seem to think it is. I just didn't want the fact that I'm sharing tips and information for getting into work with a chronic illness. I didn't want that to be misinterpreted as me saying that I think every person with a chronic illness should be in work because that is categorically not the case. As always, this stuff I do is geared towards the people who are well enough to work. So if you're one of those people and you've clicked on this video, I really, really hope you find it helpful and let's get into it now. Working with a chronic illness is hard. And that's an understatement. It is incredibly difficult. And if you've clicked on the video, the chances are you're either considering taking this step or you're in the world of work already and maybe struggling to make it work for you. And I just thought with this video, I would answer some of the most frequently asked questions. Um, I collected these over on Instagram and just try and share a bit of my knowledge on the one hand as somebody who's very much been through that process themselves and understands the difficulties of it, but also as somebody who now works in that sphere and has a better understanding of how you can advocate for yourself and what kind of support you might be entitled to as well. The world of work isn't designed for disabled bodies in general, especially those that are more unpredictable on a day-to-day -day basis. So I kind of just wanted to highlight with that with these questions I'm trying to help you to make the best of a not ideal situation being fully aware that the situation isn't ideal I'm not going to go on a whole spiel about my own employment history there's plenty of posts about that over on my blog which will be linked below there might be by the time this goes up a blog post that collates everything I've written on this topic all the different sources and all the different websites so I will try and flag if that's ready to go. But although I now work freelance, I'm now self-employed, I spent three years in employment at the start of my career. And with this video, I'm just gonna focus on employment because we can talk more about freelance life and self-employment another time. So the first category is, is work right for me? How to tell if work is right for you or sustainable with ME? That's a really difficult one, um, especially if you're around the mild moderate mark of ME. ME is the condition I personally have, so I understand that people with severe and very severe ME work is off the cards for them. But when you're in that mild moderate range, it can be a bit more of a grey area. Now, I never like to advocate for unpaid work because I think people deserve to be paid for their skills. But if you're worrying or wondering whether work is going to be sustainable for you, I think my best advice would be to consider getting a small volunteering job to start with that's quite a good way of testing what your capabilities are and how you cope and what the effects of post-exertional malaise are like while not being in an, in an environment where it's as crucial to commit to regular hours. Being in a voluntary job tends to be more flexible, there's a bit less pressure and obviously you don't have to take the financial side into consideration. So just have a look at volunteering jobs that are out there near you and consider which of these might be accessible and have a think about your hours and what kind of thing would work best for you. I do actually have a post about finding volunteering opportunities from home. Um, Volunteering in the past typically looked like going to work in a charity shop, but these days there are volunteering jobs you can do from home, so I will link that blog post down below. Knowing how or when to attempt to re-enter work after developing a chronic illness. It's quite normal, well it would be quite normal to experience nerves or anxiety at the thought of returning to work, but I think here it's important to listen to your gut and to see whether it's telling you whether the nerves or anxiety you have are purely about making that transition and changing your way of life, or if it's actual worry about getting the job done and coping and managing day to day. If you are worried that it's too much, I would also consider asking for a phased return to work. That's something you can talk about with your employer. And it means that rather than launching straight back into the job you left, you could try doing reduced hours or reduced responsibilities. So I'd encourage you to have that conversation with your employer and also to not be afraid of expressing those worries because starting small and building back up is gonna be much better for you in the longer term than just bulldozing straight in and having to leave again 
all over again, which I know people that has happened to. It's not an uncommon thing. Finding accessible jobs. This is where I get the most questions. This is where I've consistently had the most questions ever since I started blogging. And obviously it's a really key topic. So let's talk about how we can find a job that's gonna be accessible for you. Where to search for accessible jobs. I've got a list for you. I basically started collating this massive blog post in 2018 and it's just a list of where you can find all kinds of opportunities that might be more doable for you with a chronic illness. And all of the things on that list are either pathways that I've had personal experience of or I've got good reason to trust that they are okay. So there's nothing spammy in there, there's no MLMs. The places in there are the places that I personally trust and feel comfortable recommending. So rather than sit and go through all of these things one by one, I'm just gonna leave that blog post link below and then you can have a look through and click on anything that might be of interest to you. It's funny, I put that blog post together way before the first lockdown when working from home was so difficult to find. So obviously it might be the case that there are things out there now that aren't on that list, but those are the things that if anything else can, if nothing else can serve as a useful starting point. What should I look for in job adverts to know if the job has flexible hours or is remote? If you're looking on a central job site, you can filter by things like just show me remote jobs, just show me part-time jobs. That's not to say that they're automatically going to be suitable for you, but it is going to present the ones that the recruiter have actively keyed those words into. So that's a good place to start. It's also the case that not every job where these things are a possibility will advertise that straight up. It's always encouraging to see a line on the application form about how the company is committed to equal opportunities, whether they're a disability confident employer. Those are big green flags to look for, I would say. But equally, if there's a job you're interested in and it hasn't explicitly said that things like flexible working are possible, is, is possible. I can't do words today. There's been a big change in employment law to support the flexible working bill. And that essentially means that people have the right to request flexible working from day one of a job and there's less back and forth. Um, people don't feel as though they have to earn the right to work flexibly. So it's the case now that flexible working requests have to be taken seriously right from the very beginning. Where to find work that is less than part-time hours. This is such a thing that is close to my heart. And in the past, this would have been where I was recommending Astrid, which is the small charity I work for. We specialise in matching skilled people with chronic illnesses with inclusive employment opportunities. And we had a knack for negotiating reduced hours. So part-time hours in employment typically means around 16 hours a week. But the point we were trying to make is that for some people with chronic illness, it needs to be more similar to 16 hours a month. So we used to have this great online job matching service and mentoring scheme, but financial restraints on the charity mean that that isn't operating at the minute. And we are working hard to bring it back. So that's sad because Astrid was the solution and nobody else is doing what we did. But rather than dwelling on that, let's think about other things you can try. If you know that you're going to need to work significantly reduced hours, I think my best advice would be to approach people directly rather than apply and go down the traditional job application interview route. Um, I only have experience of this in a freelance capacity, which I understand is slightly different. But I think you need to approach people yourself and learn to portray your reduced hours as a strength. Now that might seem a bit counterintuitive, but to give you an example, I usually work in the charity sector and the fact that I offer reduced hours means that I am a great choice for smaller charities who might not have the budget to employ somebody to do their comms full time. So it's kind of solving two problems. I've got a reduced hours work and they are getting the skills of a qualified person who isn't gonna cost them as much to keep on their books. And obviously that's gonna differ by sector and what you're interested in, but I think consider how you can portray your reduced hours as a strength. And I know that's not easy because we're so often gaslit and made to feel as though we're less, especially in the world of work. But think about how you can particularly appeal to that person who you're talking to and how you can really advertise that reduced hours will be a great thing for them as well. How to find reduced hours work when you're fresh out of uni and have no work experience yet. Oh, that's a really tough one. My thoughts are with you. My experience was kind of the same with that one. Although I did have the advantage of, I had some work experience and qualifications um, pre-disability when I was younger. So maybe that gave me a slight leg up. My best advice here would be to consider looking for internships, ideally paid internships. That means that you can gain experience and you can earn an income at the same time and you can get the references you need for future work. 
um, but you can also learn, you can learn so much from an internship if you find the right one. Um, so I think that might be the stepping stone between graduating and entering the world of work. So again, I wouldn't be afraid to approach people in the relevant sector who might you think might benefit from an intern. Even if an internship, similar to the previous question, even if they don't advertise that they're remote working or reduced hours, it doesn't mean that you can't request this further down the line. Other useful organisations you can contact in the disability sphere, um, even break, Snowden and trust scope all offer career support especially for people in that weird middle ground if finding an internship is a struggle or doesn't feel doable for you i think the next best suggestion would be to look for a mentor in your chosen field it might just be somebody you follow online or you're connected to on linkedin and think about whether they might benefit from a virtual assistant because that could be a great role for somebody with a chronic illness who's looking to build up their skills and experience and again it's all about how you sell yourself to that person so it's not about going in and saying i have a chronic illness i'm struggling to find a job can you give me one it's not that it's more hey, I have a chronic illness, I'm really keen to learn more about you and your work, here are the skills I can offer, and the fact I'm doing reduced hours means that I wouldn't expect um, a salaried, a full-time salaried pay. So just think about how you can present yourself as something that would be great for them, as well as it being great for you. Now we're gonna move on to disclosing your disability, and the first question is, how do you initiate a conversation with a prospective employer about your condition? This is something that I agonized over. I tried to research when the right time was to disclose your condition, and from all of that research, I can conclude that there is no single right time to disclose your disability. It's gonna depend on your personal circumstances, and it's also gonna depend on the specific context of the job you're applying for at that time. I think gut instinct is key here. Sometimes it can be helpful to see where it comes up naturally, whether that's either in the job application stage, a personal statement, or even at the interview stage when you're talking to somebody face to face. I will say if your condition affects you profoundly, for example, my ME isn't something I can hide, it affects every minute of my waking day, so it isn't something that I can easily conceal. If you can relate to that, I do think it's important to be as upfront about it as early as it feels comfortable to do so, because if that is going to be an issue, I would personally rather know that early on so that you're not wasting your valuable time and energy going through an application process for a job that isn't going to be doable for you. But in the same breath, if it doesn't feel as essential to disclose your disability, it's important to remember that you are never obliged to share information about your health status that you're uncomfortable doing so. But if your disability affects you profoundly, I personally think it is worthwhile to do so. And that's actually something else that we're trying to push through Astrid at the minute. We're trying to make sure that employers are equipped to have confident conversations about chronic illness because often it's the environment that the employers and recruiters foster that can make people feel more or less comfortable in that situation. So I do think there's a responsibility on the employers to create a comfortable environment too. And I think whether or not employers are willing to do that is a good indication of what it would be like to work for that particular organisation. Advice on bringing up your disability during a job application or interview, particularly if it's invisible. This is one of the things that I think is important to think about before you go into that situation. I think you need to sit down in advance and put some time aside to think about the ways that your disability makes you more employable. And you might not think that they exist, but trust me, they do. Even if you have a fluctuating chronic illness that makes you really poorly, there are all kinds of transferable skills that come from your lived experience that actually make you a really desirable, desirable candidate to employers. We did a whole video about that, so I'm gonna link that below if you're in need of a bit of inspiration. Um, some of the stuff, you can feel free to nick ideas from there, basically. And the reason I say that is because when the time comes to disclose your disability, it might make you feel more comfortable and empowered if you can couple all that disclosure with some of the ways that it makes you a more desirable candidate, that it makes you more desirable to that organisation. So you're thinking about those key words, you're hitting those key, um, those key point scoring things in a job application and you've also had the opportunity to introduce the fact that you're living with a long-term illness and then it's up to you or, well it's up to the employer whether they want to pursue that conversation at that point in time and it's also up to you whether you want to continue that conversation or leave it there for now. It's just, it, it will differ every single time. So listen to your gut, but I do think it's really valuable to be prepared. To be or not to be open with colleagues about your illness. This is the area where I'm probably not best placed to answer because my experience of working in teams has usually been in contexts where there are other disabled employees or their disability related organisations. So it's never felt 
uncomfortable to disclose my disability in the way I imagine it might if you were the only disabled person there. Again, I think illness severity plays into your decision here. You don't have to disclose if you don't want to. There's nothing ingenuine about keeping that information to yourself. But on the flip side, if your condition is affecting you profoundly and you think that it is something that people might spot at work, I can understand why you would feel like you would want to just get that out in the open. Um, and that's probably what I would do. Sometimes the fear of disclosing can be a more preferable option to the mental effort of having to keep things in and having to put on a mask at work, which in itself that can be so exhausting. So I would try and avoid that wherever possible. And when you disclose, it really doesn't have to be a big deal. It doesn't have to be a, oh, sit down, I've got something to tell you. It doesn't have to be like that. Again, you can just drop it into the conversation wherever it feels natural. Um, you can just say something like, oh, by the way, I have a chronic illness, so doing this particular thing is a struggle, but I find it helpful to do things this way. And then I suppose the people around you have some knowledge of some of the challenges you face, and that might help them to be a better ally in the workplace as well. This next question is, will they fire me for being so poorly? And that sounds like a very loaded question. So if you're watching this, you have my empathy. I'm so sorry you're dealing with whatever you're dealing with because the anxiety of that can really add to the physical toll of what you're dealing with. The truthful answer to this is that it depends when and where you work and what the context is. It would be naive of me to sit here and say you definitely won't be fired because attitudes towards long-term illness and fluctuating disability still need so much work. But technically speaking, they shouldn't be able to fire you if you're experiencing a flare-up or a deterioration. If you want to work, they shouldn't be able to fire you purely based on those things. I think it's important to be proactive in communicating what you're experiencing. So if you can talk to your employer about what's happening before it gets to that point where you're worried about being fired. That can help ensure that both of you are on the same page, um, especially if you express your desire to continue working, because it might be that an employer assumes that you're getting really poorly. They might even think that they're doing you a favor by firing you when for a lot of people that isn't the case. And by having a conversation, you can discuss things about other workplace adjustments that might help you, whether you could benefit from a short-term leave or long-term sick leave. It really, really depends on the situation, which I know isn't a helpful answer, but I think either way, it can be valuable to know your rights. There's an organization called CIPD and they have some really helpful resources on your rights as an employee, especially if you have a long-term illness. Um, it, they do some really great stuff for both employers and employees, um, CIPD, I'm going to link that below as well. The next section is managing assumptions and stereotypes. And the first question is how to manage people misunderstanding or making assumptions with our limitations. That's a difficult one to answer because usually this thing is out of your control. And I think a lot of it depends on how assertive you are as well. Like I know some people who are absolutely incredible at advocating for themselves and standing up for their needs, but personally, I'm not naturally very assertive. so. I'm maybe not the best person to advise here. I have been in work situations before where I felt like I have had to justify myself or to explain why I'm doing things in a particular way or working in a particular way. And that can feel quite, not only uncomfortable, but it can take additional energy to have to like navigate that careful sort of disclosure. I'm gonna turn that question around and I'm gonna put it back to you, whoever is watching this video, because I could do with some tips in this area. So how do you manage people making assumptions about your disability or your limitations? What do you do in that instance? Um, if you've got any helpful advice, I would really appreciate it if you shared it in the comments. Yeah, it's definitely not a strength of mine. I can write very like powerful and feisty things online, but when I'm talking to someone face to face, I tend to just kind of shrink into myself and be like, oh, it's fine. I'll just make myself ill um, doing this thing that isn't accessible for me, which is not ideal. And I don't recommend that at all. So learning to be assertive is a skill that maybe would benefit you as much as it would clearly benefit me. <laughs> How to communicate with employers so you don't become an ongoing uncertainty for them. I think for those of us with fluctuating illnesses in particular, although somebody is never gonna truly understand what that's like, I think it is important to emphasize the fact that different days are always gonna look different. Your capabilities on one day might look very different to the next day. Sometimes that's as a result of certain tasks that you've done at work, and sometimes it's for no blooming reason at all. An example that I find helpful to use is I tell somebody that doing a smaller amount of work per day means that I can actually get more done in the longer term, because if I try and do too much in one day, I do end up burning myself out, and then the next few days I won't be able to work at all. 
So pacing myself and working in small chunks is obviously beneficial and that might not be something that an employer automatically understands. So just hearing it from your own mouth can be a really positive thing and can help you to have a better working relationship. I did also write down consider requesting a regular check-in or catch-up, although now I'm thinking about it, that does require extra energy and exertion on your part, especially if you're working reduced hours. I know how frustrating it can be when some of those hours are taken up with meetings and check-ins. So it might be worthwhile if you're working a particular number of hours, but I can understand why somebody wouldn't want to do that. I always try and keep my own meetings to a minimum, but I think a way around this would be if you're communicating via email and you're doing the usual sort of greetings, customary greetings, like, hey, how are you? How was your weekend? Sometimes it might just be worth adding a little bit of detail in response to those questions. That's a really natural, nice way of communicating it without it being like a big deal. So if someone said, how was your weekend? I could say something like, oh, it was really nice. I had a rough few symptom days, so I'm having to take things a little bit slower at the moment, but I'm doing okay. How's things with you? Just that kind of vibe, I suppose. And moving on to looking after yourself in work, this question says, how can you pace with a nine to five job? I should caveat here that I've never done full-time hours. I've never done nine till five, five days a week. At my most, I was doing nine till four. But when I was first starting out and trying to find my feet in the world of work, I was doing very long hours, which if I'm being completely honest, were over my capabilities at that time. When I was doing nine till four, um, I worked those hours, I had an hour's lunch break, and during that hour, I would wolf my lunch down and then I would go and lay down until I had to start working again. And that was better than doing nothing, but as you can imagine, it definitely wasn't ideal. And I remember I was seeing an OT at the fatigue clinic at this time and I asked their advice on what I should do. Their recommendation was instead of taking one hour for lunch and finishing at four, you could consider taking two hours off at lunch and finishing an hour later because in those two hours, you're gonna be able to have a better, more restorative rest without feeling like you needed to rush. And at first I was very, very resistant to the idea. I didn't like the fact, um, for some reason, finishing an hour later in my head seemed like a really big deal and seemed like it would be harder to pace, when in reality, the value of having that two hour rest served me really, really well. They also suggested some, something similar when I dropped down to doing three days a week rather than four or five. Um, in my head, I thought it would be better to just clump those three days together. For example, at the start of the week, I wanted to do Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, because then in my head, I had Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday to recover. But again, they were like, that's not pacing over the context of your week. So their recommendation was to do one day on and one day off. And again, I was so resistant to that idea because I liked the idea of getting it all done and out of the way. But once again, when I started doing it, I had to admit that it was a really smart decision. Believe it or not, the OTs know what they're talking about. It was just, yeah, it really made a positive difference. So think about how you might be able to space things out in a similar way. Even if you're working nine till five, if the ability to finish an hour later does work for you in the context of your broader life, it might be worth considering um, whether that's having a two hour lunch break or having an additional hours break spaced out in the day. Obviously pacing is about resting before you get tired. And when you're in a working environment, it isn't always possible to rest before you get tired, but making those changes and adjustments meant that I could rest before I got as tired and even that in itself can make a big difference. If working more flexible hours isn't possible for you or it's not something your employer is willing to accommodate, even though it should be because it's a workplace adjustment, if for whatever reason that's not the case, it might be worth looking at the tasks that you do over your day and how you balance that. You might have preferred times that are better for doing deep work versus doing admin or meetings. Um, your pattern of symptoms throughout the day is very individual, so think about the tasks that feel easier at certain times of the day and try and schedule your work day around those things. Obviously working from home can really take away the exertion of traveling or commuting or being in an office environment around lots of people. But again, if that's not possible and you do have to be in a physical workplace, um, a good adjustment to request is just having a quiet space where you can just go and just take breaks and take rest and reduce some of that sensory impact. How to work with different symptoms or abilities daily. 
Yeah, this is definitely one of the things I found most difficult about being in, in employment versus self-employment. And I know for a fact I'm not alone in that. We have research by Astrid that should be out by the time you watch this video. And that found that 89% of respondents with long-term conditions reported that fluctuating symptoms limited their ability to work. That was one of the main health-related barriers that people identified. As we've said, it can be valuable to communicate the fluctuating nature of your illness as early as possible and try your best to get employers and line managers to understand your lived experiences. Okay, this is what I was trying to explain in the last question. No matter what your work is, the chances are you're gonna have tasks that are more high energy and tasks that are lower energy during your working day. I think just having the flexibility to tailor the tasks you do on a particular day can really help to accommodate the fluctuating nature of your symptoms. I always have a rough plan of my week and what I'm gonna do every day, but if I wake up on a day and it's a particularly fatiguing day, for example, I much prefer to do work that is solitary, um, where I'm in my own unique little bubble and I don't have to communicate with other people. So on those days, I will focus on doing a writing task rather than doing my emails or conversing with other people. Whereas if it's a less fatiguing day, but it's a higher pain day, my personal preference is to take on more cognitive tasks. Um, so things that require a bit more thinking, sometimes things that require discussion with other people because I personally find that a good distraction. And again, that's gonna be incredibly unique depending on your circumstances and the job that you're working. But even if you're in employment, I think it would be really worthwhile to have a conversation about whether you can have the flexibility to custom your customize your working day depending on the symptoms you're having that day. I know that sometimes there are limitations on that when you're working towards particular goals or you're working collaboratively with other people. But the more flexibility you can have on that sense and the more your employer trusts you to make good decisions, the better I think it will be alongside fluctuating symptoms. I just don't know if I've explained that as well as I could. I'm gonna go away and think about that some more. But yeah, just don't be afraid to communicate the fact that some tasks suit you better during particular symptom moments than others and the flex having the flexibility to customise your day to accommodate those things, that in itself can be a workplace adjustment, so don't be afraid to ask for it. What to do if your boss keeps quote unquote forgetting to implement your agreed reasonable adjustments? Yeah, that's really, really tough. And a lot of employers don't realise that making sure that you're equipped and have the adjustments you need benefits everybody. If your organisation has a HR department, I would say this is for HR. I know that can feel quite intimidating and quite uncomfortable, but they are gonna be the people who are best placed to help you to highlight the adjustments you need and perhaps just gently nudge the employer into a reminder of your rights. If there's no HR or that doesn't feel possible to you, um, there's a recent initiative that's called the Health Adjustment Passport. Um, that might be quite helpful in this context actually. It's just a free document that you can get from the government website and it gives you space to describe in depth your health situation and the things you need to thrive in work. Um, and that becomes a document. It isn't sort of like certified for anybody. You can completely self-disclose. It doesn't have to be assessed. But it just means that you've got all the information about the health, your health and the adjustments you need in one place. Um, and that means that you can easily share this with new people, perhaps as you move on to new jobs or within new teams. Um, and if you have got a document like that and your employer is not being as good as they should be, you can just... I don't know, send them a gentle reminder, just say, I just wanted to check that you had a copy of my health adjustment passport. I can't remember if I sent it, but here you are. And it explains all the adjustments I require. Maybe that'll be a bit more of a subtle way to deal with something that can be a really uncomfortable conversation. And again, lack of assertiveness does hold me back here. So I'd be interested to hear any of your own thoughts on that. And the final question I'm gonna answer today is access to work aren't supporting me in the way I need. Any advice? I am so sorry this is happening to you at the minute because the truth of the matter is it's happening to me too. <laughs> if you don't know, access to work is a government scheme that helps either you or your employers to cover the additional costs of working with a disability. So if there are specific adjustments that you require but they have a financial cost to them, access to work offers a pot of money that's gonna provide you with what you need. And don't get me wrong, I am really grateful that something like that exists. It is obviously so needed. It is, however, very tricky to apply for, especially if you have a chronic illness or a less visible disability. Um, it took me three years to finally get an award. My award just isn't quite right yet. Um, I did have an advocate, but I didn't quite get what I needed. And there were also a lot of inconsistencies. So at this point in time, I am actually looking for an advocate to help me go back and challenge my award and do it all again. So 
that's going to be a load of fun and games. If you're in this similar boat right now, I would encourage you to look for an advocate, especially if you're struggling to apply for access to work. They have a much better idea of how the system works. And even if that advocate is a paid for system, um, I used a free one last time, but where I'm at now, I am considering paying somebody to help me do it properly, because if it's going to help you get the things that you really, really need to thrive in work and to make work, work more comfortable for you, um, there are so many positive implications for that. So if you do have the means to pay for it, I wouldn't rule it out. I am filming this at a time when I don't know how much this support costs yet. So maybe I'll regret saying that, but yeah, um, just I just think you should know that you don't necessarily have to do it alone. And again, I will share more information about that as I go through that process myself. Like I said right at the start, working with a chronic illness is always gonna be difficult. And for those of us who want a career and they really value their work in life, it is the case that you do usually have to make sacrifices in other areas of life. For example, I really love the career I have now and I do willingly make sacrifices because it's something that I really value, but other people won't necessarily make that choice. Other people might want to work and they might want to help contribute to paying the bills, but they don't necessarily want a career, they might just want a little part-time job that's easy and leaves them lots of energy left over to make the most of life as a whole. It can be tempting to compare yourself with other people with the same chronic illness who are working in particular ways, um, but it's not always helpful to do that. I think it's really important to look inwardly, think about what you would like out of a job, what adjustments you would need, and what state steps you can take to help you get there. The other thing I wish I'd known at the beginning is that it does get easier. When you start in a job, um, it can, well, it did for me, it absolutely floored me. I, I was, for the first, I will be completely honest, I would say for the first six months, all I could do was work. That was the entirety of my life. I was working and when I wasn't working, I was resting. But the point is, even if your condition as a whole doesn't improve, working does get easier. You do start to build up quite a unique stamina for working. My post-exertional malaise stopped being as debilitating the more I built up that stamina to work. Even though my condition wasn't improving at that time, my day-to-day -day experiences of working and the energy that required and the cognitive toll that required, it did get much easier with time. So if you're just starting out in that world or you've just started a job and you're really panicking um do make sure that you have everything you need but also don't worry too much because i promise it does get easier but obviously take that with a pinch of salt if you're in a job that is actively making your condition worse then don't feel like you have to stay in that job but if you're in a job that you're finding really really difficult and it's not leaving room for much else just know that it might not be that way forever. And I suppose the final thing I want to say is just don't forget your worth. Living with a chronic illness in this fast paced world, we're often made to feel as though we're less and that we don't have as much to offer as other people. But you are still a person who has all kinds of valuable skills and lived experience and you can really be an asset to an organisation. So even amid all the challenges of trying to find a job that works for you, please don't forget that the organisation would be really lucky to have you too. And I'm not just saying that, I genuinely mean that and it can be so easy to forget. So please just don't forget how valuable you are and how much your health and wellbeing matters because anybody would be lucky to have you. Oh, that was a lot of talking. I'm gonna go and have a rest now, but I really appreciate you watching. Thank you for being here. If you found this video helpful, I would really appreciate it if you subscribed. You can shop my books and eBooks on my website. Um, I'd love it if you joined the community on Instagram. Thank you for watching. You can subscribe if you want, and I'll see you next time.